Throughout the day, local people have joined police officers to search the fields and woods around where Sarah Payne went missing. Sarah had been playing outside with her younger sister and two older brothers when they became separated. On the 1st of July 2000, eight-year-old Sarah Payne vanished while playing one summer's eve. Seventeen days later, she was found, murdered. Roy Whiting, an already convicted paedophile, had taken her life. What was to follow became one of the biggest public outcries in UK history. Sarah's family, left torn apart by the devastation, were surged to campaign for a major change in British law, determined Sarah's death would not be in vain, making this a crime that shook Britain. She said, have you got Sarah? And then the boys chirped in and, you know, I can't find her, I can't find her. So it, it was, and it was that quick. It was just that quick. Once separated from the other children, police believe she may have become lost. They say there's no evidence to suggest that she's been abducted. The only time he took his eyes off was just to turn around to make sure Charlotte and Luke were okay. In that time she'd gone. He was seconds behind her. The police needed the help of everybody in the country. In a Sussex field tonight, police are examining the body of a little girl found just 10 miles from where Sarah Payne went missing at the beginning of the month. I mean, I lost control completely and utterly. I, I cried, I screamed, I shouted for her. Both the police and the probation service in Sussex feared that Roy Whiting would strike again but were powerless to stop him. When you're dealing with paedophiles, particularly people who have been arrested before, um, it, it, the, this is their life is not getting caught. Fine, like I say, you just get worse because you're actually saying it out loud to somebody, you know, my daughter's missing. Sarah Payne was a beautiful, fun-loving eight-year-old. One of four children, she was the apple of her family's eye. Sarah was the third child of four. Anybody who's got a big family will understand is that you'll kind of have your place in a family. And I guess Sarah was really the imagination. She was the first girl to come along, so it was fairies and pixies and dolls and, you know, pretty things because she was the first girl born for a long time into the family. Um, so it was all, you know, grannies buying pretty dresses and little socks and, and all sorts of things. So she was very much a girly girl. She didn't need to be robust because she's, you know, two, two big brothers. And then when her little sister came along, her little sister decided that she'd be the tomboy, thank you very much, and that was it. So it's just a big heart, really. A really big heart. You know, I was never the best housekeeper in the world. Everything was, there was no sort of strict routines about our house. Um, dinner was at a certain time and bedtime was at a certain time, but other than that, everything was just kind of, you know, as it happened. It was just mad, messy and noisy all the time. When we rowed, it was massive rows, you know, when we played, it was loud games, so it was just you know, like that. It was just a uh, force to be reckoned with, I think. The tragic murder of Sarah Payne will be told through the eyes of her mum, Sarah, and Phil Clark an officer on the case. Saturday morning in the Payne house. As Mike sleeps off his night shift, Sarah heads to work at a local pub with Charlotte and Sarah. Took the girls to work with me in the morning as I normally did on a Saturday. It was a massive garden there, so I love to play out there with the you know, daughter of the landlady and that. Got back. Um, just, you know, packed everything up, packed the kids in the car and just headed for the coast. The Paynes make the journey to West Sussex to spend the weekend with Mike's parents. Well, it was July, it was quite hot. Um, we hadn't been to see Terry Les for quite some time. We always used to go sort of once a month at least, kind of Sunday dinner and, and that kind of thing. Just an off-the-cuff off decision, really. It was a nice weekend. We hadn't had anything planned. 
Grandparents Les and Terry quickly greet the family as they arrive. As food is prepared, the family settles in. Everything ready. Um, dinner almost on the table. Um, get in, um, have a drink, say hello, catch up quickly, um, have dinner all together. Um, kids go out to play, sort of in the garden. Um, clear up and, and, just, and just normal family life, really. With the warm afternoon drawing to a close, Sarah and her family take a walk to the seafront after dinner. I decided to go for a walk on the beach um, with the children because I'd promised them. Uh, Terry had wanted to, us to see a friend of his house. Uh, he'd been doing up a house in the village. So we decided to walk along there. And that's obviously when the children asked if they could stay at the beach. But what happens next is to change the Payne family forever. We stayed with them for a little while, we threw some pebbles in, um, and they just wanted to stay there, you could see it was, I mean, it was a lovely, beautiful evening. The boys had, had been allowed, because they were 13 and 12, so they'd been allowed to explore by themselves a little bit over the last sort of year or two, um, so they knew their way around. And they asked if the girls could stay, the girls were begging if they could stay. And it was kind of, it's just one of those moments in life where you just, you make a decision about these things, don't you? When your children come to a certain age, you just decide whether it's okay or not. You know, they had strict instructions to do exactly as Lee said, he was the oldest. If they got bored or tired, they would just stroll back to nannies. And just my last memory of Sarah is just her playing and screaming around the beach and waving to me as I sort of, you know, left the beach. As Sarah plays happily on the beach with her brothers and sister, Sarah, Mike and Terry head to visit friends. Stopped at the pub for half, and we were going there literally half. It was a balmy summer so like evening. Walked back around the fields, so it was just that amount of time, and that's all it was. We didn't stay anywhere any longer than, you know, 10, 15 minutes. No, you know, it was no... There was no rush about it, but there was also, you know, we wanted to get home for the evening and just settle down, get the kids in bed and, you know, just have our, have our evening. Yet as evening sets in and they stroll back to the house, the calm is broken. And as we got to the house, Les was standing outside, which I thought was very, very unusual. Um, she was holding Charlotte tightly by the hand and the boys were sort of around. She said, have you got Sarah? And then the boys chirped in, and, you know, I can't find her, I can't find her. So it, it was, and it was that quick. It was just that quick. My daughter's missing. And it's like an echo going off in your head that just is um, uncontrollable fear, just real fear. Sarah Payne has just been told her eight-year-old daughter, Sarah, is missing. After playing with her siblings less than 150 yards from her grandparents' home, she is now nowhere to be seen. Your eyes are everywhere. You immediately start looking. I grabbed Charlotte, I think, and I, I went um, up towards the main road along the main, the, the main lane. <laughs> it's really only a car wide. I went that way. Mike went across the fields. Um, Terry went in, you know, towards the beach. So we're covering every angle. Les stayed very much sort of around the front of the house in case she stumbled back that way. Um, everyone calling and looking. I got to the end of the, the road and realized there's just no way. This is. She was a, a timid child. She couldn't even play hide and seek for more than two minutes without coming out and saying, why haven't you found me yet? Yeah, so she wasn't a child that would do those kind of games. The family comb the countryside, fearful that their little girl is out alone. And as the shouts echo across the fields, Sarah pieces together her family's last movements. And they'd gone to play in the field as they'd done on many occasions. You know, the corn was high, so it was you know, a brilliant place to play. 
that Sarah had stumbled and fallen, um, got in a little bit of a tantrum, decided she was going to go back to Nanny's house. Lee had followed her. Um, same time Charlotte had fallen and stumbled as well, so sort of one boy's attention was on one and the other boy was on the other. They did everything right, everything. Uh, Lee never took his eye, he, the only time he took his eyes off was just to turn around to make sure Charlotte and Luke were okay. In that time she'd gone. Sarah Payne has now been missing over an hour. Despite the family's frantic attempts to find her, the eight-year-old has vanished. We passed several people, all of us. People joined in with the search because they could see how worried we were. And there's also that part of you that just thinks they're just there, you know, you just can't see them. You know what kids are like, the minute you, you reach that absolute moment of panic, that's when they go boo, or, you know, they appear from nowhere and start giggling all over the place. But there was kind of this nagging thing, well, what if she'd walked across the fields and just got lost? So it's just covering everything. With no leads and darkness closing in, Sarah faces the painful realisation that extra help is now needed. Just said, look, we've got to call the police. Um, she doesn't know where she is. She's lost. Uh, God knows where she is. Emergency, Rich Stoddard. Uh, please, please, I've lost my daughter. Please, thank you. Right, call you through the police emergency. What's the problem? Um, I've lost my eight-year-old daughter. She's been missing about an hour and three quarters now. Sarah Payne rang the police, I think, at about quarter to nine on the Saturday night and reporting an eight-year-old missing girl. And, of course, that suddenly became a high-priority incident. It received the notice of the command officer for the division straight away. Police resources were drafted away from the usual Saturday night policing in order to assist with that search right from the start. The phone call to the police was, was so difficult. It's one of those, do I, don't I, because as soon as you do, you've made it real. Uh, my very first thoughts were that potentially we've got an extremely big uh, policing operation uh, on hand. And that was going to take all the resources that Sussex police could muster. It's get worse because she was actually saying it out loud to somebody, you know, my daughter's missing. And like I say, just thank God they took it seriously. Police rush to the scene, and the Payne family anxiously relay details of the day. As soon as the police came, they sort of got the family back to find out exactly what had happened and everything else. I don't think we even put the children to bed until the search was called off. All the obvious places where somebody of that age could have fallen into, you know, the ditches, the culverts, and all about those sort of places were done straight away within an area of about 500 metres or so around from where she was last seen. Uh, she wasn't at home, she was at her grandparents' house and she'd not been out playing in, in that area before, uh, as far as we knew, so uh, she could have just simply wandered off and got lost. It was highly likely that she'd been abducted, but she could have got lost. It, 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 it was highly likely that she'd been taken from the place, but she could have fallen down a well. The most notable thing about the surrounding area from where Sarah went missing was the absolute lack of any evidence. The absolute lack of any clothing or any of her property or anything to do with her. It was devoid of anything that related to Sarah Payne, as if she had been whisked away. But as the search for Sarah intensifies and more manpower is drafted in, her brother could hold the key to her disappearance. Really, it was just a case of you know, talking to each of the boys, find out in, in detail 
what was going on. And then Lee pulling me to one side and saying, Mum, I did, I did see something, but I don't know what to say or not. Um, and he'd seen, two, he'd seen a van and a car. And I said, well, can you, can you remember? And he said, well, they're about the same time. And he said, but the man in the white, in the white van, you know, he smiled and waved at me. And I said, do you remember what he looks like? He said, yeah. So I said, well, I think we better tell the policeman. He said, well, do you think it's important? We don't want them looking for someone that, and not looking for Sarah. So it's kind of, yeah, we have to tell them everything and then let them decide what's, what's right and wrong. He was the only person to see what potentially could have been an abductor. And he identified to the police that he was driving a large white van being driven by a scruffy individual who smiled and waved to him as he went past. Eight-year-old Sarah Payne has now been missing for over 24 hours. Whilst playing in a field with her siblings, she has vanished from sight. The scale of the police hunt is now escalating as the hours tick by, and officers are desperate for any clues that could help find the little girl. Our best chance of finding her alive was to hope that she'd been abducted and been locked up somewhere. So the main gut instinct, if you like, was to look for lockups where she might still be alive. The second was to find some sort of hideous little natural trap that she might have been caught in, some culvert, some drain, some whatever it might be, you know, some innocent uh, reason why she hadn't turned up. But the focus was always at the beginning to find her alive. Members of the public are now offering to help search in their droves, all praying Sarah is found safe and well. Meanwhile, as part of the inquiry, a sex offender living in the area, Roy Whiting, is called upon by police. If this little girl had been abducted, th there's obviously the usual suspects. You've got to sort out who is the most likely. When Sarah went missing, Roy Whiting told the police that he was at a fun fair in Brighton. The Inference being that he'd been cruising the areas where young people might congregate. Whiting gives nothing away, but his demeanour is suspicious. After questioning, officers decide to monitor him. Meanwhile, Sarah and the family are urged in front of the country's media in an emotional plea. The police needed the help of everybody in the country. And one of the best ways to get everybody on side is to get the empathy that comes with seeing the parents, even if they're in a, di a state of, of distress. We got asked to do a, a, an initial press conference. Um, and that was, I think, on the Monday after she'd gone missing. She went missing on Saturday. I think it was on the Monday. And we went and see Martin Hunter Hill, and he he tried to give me sort of what I should say, you know, tried to help me write what I should say and, and, and that kind of thing. And I just, I, I looked at him and I just thought, I can't, you know, just tell me what you need, what do you need from this? And that was the obvious thing to do and it was done very early. I think the first time that the Payne family uh, made an appearance was on the Tuesday morning, if I remember right. We've got lots of people hundreds there you wouldn't believe how many people are coming but they're coming and it won't be long the hunt for sarah now involves over 500 police officers and scores of volunteers we had a specialist search team uh, that could do underwater searching a uh, helicopter was used one of the most valuable assets to me in the search was the military. Jets were actually photographing uh, every square inch of Sussex and 
some parts of Surrey. A specialist team was looking at photographs for newly disturbed earth, for bonfires, for anything that was unusual. There was always something to do, some piece of evidence to look at that had been found in the search. Because, I mean, don't forget, we searched most of that area. I mean, sort of within a 20 mile radius, we searched. So we had to look at every child's shoe that was found, every child's toy, every pair of knickers, every jumper. To be deploying 500 officers, the vast majority were Sussex police officers, on one operation for two, three, four, five, going up to 14 consecutive days, it's like the whole of your police force is looking for Sarah Payne. The hunt for Sarah is quickly turning into one of the biggest media cases in recent history. Her image is used across newspapers and television reports nationwide in a desperate plea for information. As a result, the leads into the search for Sarah come in thick and fast. By the time that we'd got to Wednesday, there was over 10,000 pieces of information coming into the uh, Casualty Bureau. That's not 10,000 phone calls, that's 10,000 phone calls that have actually got pieces of information on the back. I remember quite well uh, a sighting of Sarah Payne in the company of a gentleman at Knutsford Services, I think on the M6. It was such a powerful piece of evidence that an awful lot of store was put in that she was either in the Midlands or had been taken up north. There were always sightings of her. There was one particular sighting which really gave us joy and hope and as soon as I heard the woman speak I knew that it wasn't Sarah. Days now turn into weeks and despite no positive sightings of Sarah, the nation prays for her safe return. Sarah and her family draw strength from the support. We needed to maintain a very close link with the family. So. Uh, not only were people appointed as family liaison officers, but they'd actually been trained to do the job. And the job is to support the family, to actually be able to interpret what is happening from the police perspective. And it's a very, very difficult job because you get so close to people at a time of great, great stress that you start to share their stress with them and you start to share their burden. I needed to know what was being reported by the family liaison officers um, and whether or not there was anything that was coming out from the family that could actually help us with the search for Sarah. Family liaison officers Sean Scott and David Dow are also on hand day and night to help the family through the agonising hours. The moments I liked best were the ones when, just before Dave and Sean arrived in the morning, was the one when, just before they put, you know, come through the door, it was any news. So there was always that hope every time they came through the door. Um, and sadly that just didn't happen. We sat down and we talked about scenarios of, about her coming home about having a bag ready for her, which was something to cling on to. I hadn't thought of doing that, so that was that. That was, you know, getting her bag ready, so if they found her, I could be taken straight to her. For Sarah's brothers and sister, their worlds have been turned upside down. They were the last people to see the eight-year-old and are now desperately keen to make sure their sister is found. I couldn't tear the other children away from the news at all. They just had it on 24 hours a day. Um, and every day they were coming up with scenarios to, you know, to get the press involved, to do this, to do that, wherever they looked, you know. So it was, you know, it was a real challenge to keep them occupied as well. They went to the police station, the police were fantastic with them, you know, showed them all the computers, photo fits with Lee. I mean, Charlotte had very simple questions. 
and the boys had quite intense questions. You know, what, where were the police going with this? Did they have any evidence for this? Did they have this? You know, Lee was like, did you chase up the green car? You know, did you find the man that I saw? And that was from no pushing from anyone. It's just they needed to be part of that. It was their sister that was missing. It's been 17 days since Sarah Payne was last seen, playing in a field right next to her grandparents' house. Family and friends have been clinging to the hope that she will return safe and well. Thousands of people have offered their help, but despite a nationwide appeal and scores of officers on the case, Sarah hasn't been seen since. Now, family liaison officer Sean Scott arrives with news. And I could just see by Sean's face that he needed to tell me something. I didn't know what that was. I soon had a, a good idea that it was serious. And I didn't want that moment to come. When it came to it, I, I didn't want it to come. Sorry. I kind of knew what was coming. I just couldn't let him speak. Um, Michael arrived and Sean quickly sat him down. And I didn't realise the urgency of it they'd found a body. we found the body of a child. Uh, it was a little girl and you know, there were no other little girls missing at that time so they could only presume it was Sarah but it wasn't definite. And at that same moment it was announced in the news. So unfortunately the entire family heard it at exactly the time we heard it in the garden. The children were rushing out the back door and the rest of the family were kind of behind them and is it true, is it true? And none of us were sure it was her. Uh, we had to wait for testing and um, somebody had to go and view the body and all those things. And then again we started doing the glimmer of hope. You know, we started it all over again. The body was actually found by a farm worker after it had been disturbed from being buried. The worst thing that can happen is for this particular inquiry, after all that's gone on, to turn into a murder inquiry. There was a sort of a certain inevitability about it at the time. A swift forensic examination is ordered and the body is identified. Sean came to me and he said, you know, we are a thousand percent sure because they've done the DNA, the, the coroner had worked so hard really quickly because he knew the situation and everyone had. I was determined, I was absolutely determined that nobody else could possibly know it was her. I needed to see for myself. So Sean said that he would go first and he would come back and he would describe it to me and if I still wanted to go, then he would go with me. It was late afternoon by the time he came back. And he was in pieces, he was, I could just see. Just, just a shadow of the man that I saw just a few hours ago. And I knew at that point that I couldn't go and see her like that. And I knew it wasn't right to and I didn't think that she'd want me to. I felt really guilty at not going though. You know that's silly? Just felt so, so guilty for not going. And then there was this big why question again. I knew that she wouldn't have fought and I knew that she wouldn't have struggled. So there would just be no reason. The body of Sarah Payne has been found by a farm worker 17 miles from her grandparents' home. For over two weeks, her mum, Sarah, and the family have prayed for her safe return and worked tirelessly with the police. But now, their hope has gone. Sarah and the family receive the news they never wanted to hear. You 
know, all sorts of things going around in my brain at that time. Then, I mean, I knew that she died. I knew that she died quickly. That was a, a saving thing for me. She hadn't suffered for ages. And then there was this big why question again. You know, I knew that she wouldn't have fought, and I knew that she wouldn't have struggled. You know, even if she'd done it initially, she didn't have any strength enough to push push anyone around. The emotion at this state is, is huge sadness, uh, absolutely enormous sadness. The fact is it, it, it became clear that we had an offence, serious offence, to detect. Officers now focus their attention on the murder inquiry and press for any clues that might lead to Sarah's killer. A lady in a nearby village calls the police. She'd seen a shoe on the side of the road, I think something like about eight days before. And when she went back, it was still there. And very, very sensibly, she didn't touch it, she reported it to the police. And that was one of the most dramatic uh, moments. It set off a whole new body of searching, of course. Every single field, hedge, for miles around was then scrutinised for Sarah's clothing. Three days later, in an unusual twist of fate, Roy Whiting, who was questioned a couple of weeks ago, comes to the attention of the police once more. He was put under surveillance. It was during that surveillance that he stole the motor car. Take off two, two. We've got a white Nova in, uh... um, he obviously wanted to get out of Crawley. He'd gone back to Crawley. And he stole this motor car. The police officers who were watching him saw him steal the motor car. The police then tried to arrest him. He tried to escape by ramming the police vehicles. And it was for that crime that he was again arrested and remanded in custody. So from that moment on, Roy Whiting was in prison. As Whiting sits in custody for a separate offence, police question him on Sarah's disappearance again. Once Sarah's body was found, uh, Roy Whiting was the prime suspect. It was imperative that he needed to be rearrested and spoken to again in the terms of the murder inquiry. When Peter Kennett took over the investigation, that's when it turned into a, a murder investigation. Um, Every single day he tried to get his officers to prove to him that it wasn't Roy Whiting because his name just kept coming up. Even if it was only on the premise of coincidence and happenstance and all the rest of it, the coincidence by this time was enormous. As the pressure mounts on Whiting, Sarah and her family turn their focus to a memorial to honour their daughter's short life. The outpouring of grief could easily have been turned to anger. And that's what people were saying to me, you know, you know, um, if they caught him or her, they'd, they'd hang, and all that stuff that was just so nasty around Sarah's name. And they weren't meaning to be nasty, they just were so upset and angry themselves. The whole thing touched a nerve somewhere. It touched a nerve throughout the body of the United Kingdom. I think since that time, there's been some really notable cases that have kind of followed suit. But this was really the very, very first that was so enormous in the mind of the public. And so we decided to do the memorial um, as a way of ending it for everyone that had been involved. And also so that we could pull her back to us. We'd given so much of her away. and and it, although that was entirely the right thing to do, I don't regret any of those decisions to this day. 
it's also very hard when an entire country has ownership of your daughter and, and, and what you want to do is you, you want to go away to a little corner and just mourn and just deal with life. Mourners flock to pay their respects to Sarah and through all the heartache her mum vows that the loss of her beautiful daughter will not be in vain. She begins to research the law and the rights of sex offenders. There were vast things that were really wrong with the system. Um, and that's where we started learning that it wasn't just one thing that needed changing. It was entirely right that parents had the right to know. You know, in America they, they're told whether they want to know or not. And it all just seemed so wrong and so pointless and so... Um, just, you know, somebody somewhere must have something to say. This has got to change something, for God's sake. It can't, this can't ever be allowed to happen again. Sarah quickly realizes the need for change. Inspired by Megan's Law in America, she presses for controlled access to information on sex offenders in a passionate bid to stop this tragedy happening again. So basically we looked at all the things to do with sex offenders and it just seemed that everyone was playing into their offender's hand. Nobody was looking after these children. We found that the police's hands were tied an awful lot of the time when it came to offenders. So if they saw an offender outside a school, the police had been taught they couldn't move them along. They couldn't stop them from standing there because it was the offender's human rights to stand wherever they damn well pleased. They could come out of prison and not sign on with the local police station for four weeks, which all just seemed so very wrong. And so, with the backing of the News of the World, the fight for Sarah's law starts. I just decided that it was the best thing for us to do was to try and turn this awful, awful thing that had happened to us. Maybe turn it around for other kids, but also just make people aware. The News of the World is a massive paper. We started naming and shaming because paedophiles exist through secrecy. Everybody knows that. That is their one tool. If you pick out every other tool in, in their toolbox, the one thing they need to survive is secrecy. And I'm like, well, why are the authorities keeping their secrets? Very often, children that have been sexually abused end up living in the same village as a sex offender when they're let out. I needed other parents to know this is going on because I was so shocked. I was so shocked, and that's why, you know, that's why we went with naming and shaming, it was because when people opened the paper, they needed to be as shocked as I was when I found, first found out about Roy Whiting. As the campaign gathers pace, officers investigating Roy Whiting delve into every area of his life. To me, it seemed that this man had specifically bought a certain kind of van. It's a furniture van. It was clad in plywood on the inside to stop furniture being damaged. And then when you've done something in it, you just strip out the plywood and burn it. You know, he was definitely forensically aware. When you're dealing with paedophiles, particularly people who have been arrested before, um, th th this is, their life is not getting caught. So they know about forensic evidence. But, in actual fact, two hairs, Sarah Payne's hairs, were found in the van. Forensic tests on the van have brought a major breakthrough. However, Whiting's link to the murder isn't going to end there. The black shoe found three days after Sarah's body now reveals evidence, incriminating him even further. The shoe was found and it had this fibre on it, which took a long time but was subsequently tied in with fibres on clothing found in Roy Whiting's van. All the coincidence in the world can't get away from that because nowhere, never, had Roy Whiting ever said to anybody that he had been in the company of Sarah Payne. And that was one of the main pieces of forensic uh, 
evidence that, that came forward, and I think, in my mind, was the crucial piece of, of evidence. If that shoe hadn't been found, Roy Whiting could be at large today. As forensic evidence directly links Whiting to the murder, he is quickly questioned once more. Whiting was cold and clinical, uh, nervous, uh, chain-smoking, uh, solicitor-reliant, re uh, exhibiting all the behaviours you would expect of a guilty person. You murdered Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne. Roy Whiting is charged with Sarah's murder. As he awaits trial, Sarah steers her campaign and sets about changing the system in child protection. And so we changed everything in a little way. So things like the four weeks before they sign on, we brought it down to 72 hours. Signing on in person, they didn't have to do that before. <laughs> With a photograph now, a photograph may be taken every year. It doesn't have to be, but it may be taken every year. Fingerprints may be taken every year doesn't have to be, but they can if they want to. I mean, we've tightened everything now. Everything's tightened. The most fantastic thing that came out of those early meetings, it was the agencies working together, finally working together. Seventeen months after Sarah's disappearance, Roy Whiting stands trial. It's interesting from the point of view of a police officer when a verdict comes out because you're never in the jury room and you've no idea as to whether or not they'd seen the case in the same way as you had when you'd lived with it to some extent. I had no doubt whatsoever that by the time that Roy Whiting went to court that he was guilty of the murder of Sarah Payne. No doubt whatsoever in my mind. Roy Whiting. Whiting is found guilty of the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne. He pleads not guilty, but the evidence is overwhelming. He receives life imprisonment, and the judge recommends he is never released. What that gave me and my family is justice, nothing more. Nothing more. It doesn't give us back Sarah. It doesn't change anything in our lives other than the fact that we are f afforded the luxury of not having to think about the offender, the person that hurt. Sarah. Um, and because of his long sentence, I hope we never do. Sarah Payne's fight for justice since the murder of her daughter has been relentless. And the changes still being made through her sheer determination are all steps in better protection for children. I just couldn't imagine how a man could have a previous conviction for hurting a child and still be living in a village with children. You know, still be living in a seaside town, for God's sake. But there will always be those that want to hurt children. I don't understand them, I don't want to understand them. I know how they work because I've had to learn. Um, I know what works when, it's, when it comes to treatment with them. Um, and the only thing that works is for you to stand in between that offender and a child. That's all that works. The man who murdered Sarah Payne is behind bars, but that will never stop her family fighting to prevent it happening to anyone else. Legislation is becoming stronger, but does this prevent another tragedy? Well, I don't think that you can ever legislate for uh, what peculiar people do. And the more, uh, the more difficult you make it for people. If they've got a will, they will work at it. They'll work at it like a hobby, they'll work at it like a job, they'll work at it so that they can get to a position where they can do what they want to do. I mean, I hope that somewhere in the future we will, we will find a way of, of stopping a first offence, of stopping someone from going down that road. I always remember her with a smile. I miss her every single day of my life, and I will miss her forever. Nothing will ever change that. But I miss not arguing with her. I miss 
not having those teenage years, I miss her not putting me through sheer hell, slamming doors, um, hormones, periods, boyfriends, um, and then the future that, you know, marriage, children of her own, a good career. All of those things that have been robbed from her were robbed from all of us. We were lucky to have her for the eight years that we had her. And I'm so glad that we did. I wouldn't take that away for one minute.